all you really see online is the women get alimony forever and she'll take everything. But there was where, let me see if I can find it. Um, it was from Reuters, I think. And they said that basically alimony almost doesn't happen anymore because it just seemed socially unacceptable. Um, about 25% of the cases, there were about 25% of divorce cases in 1960 and only 10% today and some as low as 8%. And since the Supreme Court ruled that it can't be biased to one gender or the other, that women now have to participate. And women don't want to pay it. They almost have more of a um, aversion to it than men. So they are trying to do a lot of alimony uh, reformations. So I guess in the studies that you've seen or um, polls that you've done, like who has the worst outcome for divorce or does it seem to be pretty fair? Yeah, I made a thread on alimony as well, and it's exactly as you said, you know, that it's not that common that people receive alimony now. The marriage typically has to be long. Uh, the wife has to be older and that sort of a thing. And often alimony doesn't last all your whole life. It's usually only for a few years at this point. So typically what happens, and this is very consistent across the research, is that after a divorce, you know, there's some division of assets, but women tend to enter a period of poverty for about five years, and then they kind of return to baseline. So economically, women almost always do worse than men following a divorce. And I think a lot of men don't see it that way. And I can, you know, certainly understand that that point of view, because it's like, you know, imagine you're in a situation, you're the one earning all of the money, and you pay for everything and all of that. And that's the way that you see it, even though, you know, finances are shared, you're married, so technically it's belongs to both people, then you get divorced, and you have to split everything. And so of course, the perception is going to be like, she took half of the things. But the man's the one with the job. He's the one, you know, that is able to just continue earning that kind of income. Now he doesn't have a second person to provide. So men tend to get back on their feet really, really fast after a divorce. But imagine if you're a woman, like you said, and you have no other opportunity. You've lost basically that opportunity cost, right? You could have been spending that time going to school, pursuing a career, getting an education, and making your own money. But you've been a housewife for the last 25 years. You have no skills. You are just thrust out into the world in this economy. Right. And you're then you're in big, big trouble. So I think a lot of women know that and they see that and they're postponing marriage. That's a big reason why marriage is being postponed now. Uh, they're later in life. They're saying, I got to go back to school. They're doing all these things because they realize like something could happen. And it's not even necessarily a divorce that could happen. It's, you know, he could die. Anything could happen. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. he could lose his job, whatever. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, it just seems like we're getting told one side of the story. There was this other statistic I saw that was real. So I again, like I kind of was like, oh man, you know, I have two boys so I can really sympathize for like the male perspective a lot. And maybe sometimes that's a blind spot for me. Um, especially when it came to divorce, I had someone on the podcast like ages ago and he was talking about how, how awful the system is for men. And I'm not saying that it, there aren't really horrific outcomes. Like obviously there are. Um, but when it came to the passing of the no fault divorce, we hear that that is the reason that we see an uptick in it and we've kind of covered that there is no uptick to begin with. And basically women are just divorcing because they're bored or they think that they can do better. And it kind of vilifies the female perspective. And I found a study that said for the first five years following the no fault adoption, they follow, they followed several States and the rate of suicide from wives dropped from uh, dropped about eight to thirteen percent, and then the rates of domestic violence were reduced by thirty percent. So that's a win. That's a that's a win for everyone, and it's a perspective that not a lot of people are talking about. Is there there are sure there are people that quote fall out of love or cheat or think that they can do better on both sides. Like there are men and and women that are you know making these claims. But there's also a very real consequence of not being able to divorce, and that is women killing themselves or being constantly beat or children getting beat. So I think that I don't want the government telling me I can't leave a contract. That's kind of scary. So it's coming from this side that preaches small government, but at the same time, you want the government to say who you're in relationship with is kind of odd. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it's interesting looking at the reasons for divorce because there's a lot of discourse in all of these spaces as well that talk about women initiate more divorces, which is generally true. I, I wrote, I had a really big review that I did on reasons for divorce, who initiates more divorces. And, and so that's something we see. Women initiate more divorces, but the discourse can't just stop there because it's like, why do women initiate more divorces? Uh, sometimes, you know, if someone asks for a divorce, it's because the other person did something. And that tends to be kind of what we see in the literature, something we know really robustly 
across psychology is that men engage in more antisocial behavior across the board. So men cheat at rates about twice as much as women do. Men are much more likely to abuse substances. Men typically, you know, are more likely to engage in domestic violence, although there's some research that indicates it might be kind of similar. I think because people, you know, tend to select assortatively for, for violence. If you have a couple that's aggressive, often they're both aggressive. But those differences, those sex differences in basically antisocial behavior can explain a lot of kind of the reasons for divorce initiation, kind of the difference there, why we see women initiating more. And additionally, if you look at beyond who initiates the divorce, which is often measured just by asking couples like who asked for it first, if you go beyond that and you ask, did you both want the divorce? Then you see agreement is really, really high. And the top reason, you know, cited kind of for divorce is just like, uh, we weren't feeling it anymore, basically. Like, like we just weren't compatible at that point. So it's very often the case that when it finally gets to the point of divorce, that both people are pretty on board with it, even if one person wanted it more or initiated it. Both people usually kind of see the cards and they know like this isn't working and they're ready. Is there is there one sex that's having a better post-divorce outcome uh, romantically? Like is someone more fulfilled in the next relationship or finding a long-term relationship after divorce? So I think, I think the research on that's actually kind of mixed. Uh, I think men are more likely to experience loneliness, a few mental health problems following the divorce for the period of about two, three years after. But yeah, the research really isn't super clear on who is doing better. I think women might tend to do a little bit better single in general, you know, which is kind of supported by the research that if you look at male and female singles, uh, women who are single tend to report being happier with it. Many, many more women who are single say I'm single by choice and that sort of thing. So women seem to maybe need a man a little bit less than, than men kind of need a woman. So I think maybe that kind of contributes as well. Well, that's interesting. The idea of leaving a relationship because you're not feeling, quote, in love seems a little bit like a trap, especially if it's a committed one. I was reading, um, it was Recapture the Rapture by Jamie Wheel. And in the beginning of the book, he talks a lot about like the neuroscience behind like a couple of things like mob mentality, falling in love, that kind of thing. And it was interesting with the neurochemistry, he was saying, that that lasts like seven months of where you get like this perfect cocktail of like butterflies and excitement and just you can't keep your hands off of each other. It's it's biological. It's not it's probably both. It's biological and maybe spiritual and something else, but there is a lot of biology behind it. And that shelf life is usually about seven months to a year. So when that goes away and then that is your like your baseline and you're like, if I don't have that, then that must mean that there's something wrong with the relationship. I think that that can set you off into a trap. And then you add the stressors that come with long-term relationships like bills, moving, kids, um, health, et cetera. Like the, the list goes on and on. So that kind of uh, compounds onto each other. And then you get into the neurochemistry of emotions and feelings and states. So if you're in a negative place, you're saying to your brain, this is what we're doing. And that keeps on repeating. So then you keep on being agitated with your partner and keep seeing everything from this low that you're at. And you, unless you do a very conscious pattern interrupt, it's almost like you're at the whims of chemistry at this point. So it takes a lot of work to even be able to recognize that, like a lot of meditation to say, I'm not this these thoughts, right? And say, we are going to do something different. Like I feel like shit right now, or I'm really mad at you right now, but I'm choosing to do something else. Do you have, um, like, have you seen any research or protocols or anything that can kind of reestablish that bond within the relationship, like that intimacy, that connection, that falling in love feeling? Yeah, I'm not sure if I've seen anything that can reestablish that falling in love feeling. But yeah, what you said is, is, is correct. That typically across the research, this is a short period, you know, on Sternberg's triangular theory of love, a lot of good research on this, it's typically called passionate love or infatuation, romantic love. And it is that feeling like you described butterflies and all of that. And yeah, you know, this can last, you know, seven months in some people it can last their whole life. So, so there are individual differences here that in some relationships with some people, they can just continue feeling that way. It's probably a little bit less common for some people. It lasts, you know, a little bit longer, three to five years, but it does fade. And at that point, the relationship needs some kind of bond there where people you know, are still kind of invested and committed. And I think a lot of that is going to come down to a deliberate choice. How, how well do people get along together? How invested are they with their day-to-day -day behaviors? Are they doing things to reestablish and reaffirm that bond? And, and I think you know, this is kind of where the realm of like coaching and therapy and all of that uh, – does well, and a lot of the research is not really focused on this, but you know, things like going on regular date nights, 
doing things that are romantic deliberately to kind of cultivate that. Because even if, you know, you don't feel necessarily that extreme passion that you did, you know, in the first three months, uh, you can still love that person. You can still be very, very committed and want to be with them. And and related to that, you know, people don't break up from long-term relationships, marriage or not, lightly. They usually have to get to a point where they feel pretty, pretty bad. It's not just yeah. frivolous. So maintaining that, even absent, you know, like extreme feelings of passionate love, I think it's not that difficult if people want to and they're putting forth the effort to do it. So there is this recent uh, article by Thomas uh, Seger, Seger, he's the, one of the founders of the Morozco Forge cold plunges. And he was saying that if you do a cold plunge with your partner and you're making sure that you have skin to skin contact, so whether it's your you know knees or hands, feet, whatever, touching, and you do eye gazing, I forget how long it was. I want to say it's at least a few minutes that it can actually start to kind of recreate some of that neurochemistry. I haven't tried it yet because I hate being cold, but I thought that that was really interesting. And then for people people that are risk takers or really like something that's maybe a little bit more avant-garde. Uh, I want to say it's MAPS that's doing some of this, but they all do couples therapy with MDMA. And I know some people that do that every yeah. anniversary. So every wedding anniversary, they'll do M like an MDMA ceremony together to reconnect. And I heard that it's very, very um, helpful. So there, there are ways that people are trying to figure it out. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, you know, there's a lot of research as well that indicates that uh, when couples are more in love, they do make more eye contact, they kiss more, uh, they touch each other more, they cuddle more and all of that. And we know that there's always a bi-directional effect with behavior and feelings and psychology and all that. So it's, it's kind of like research that shows just making yourself smile, just a fake smile will actually kind of boost your mood. You know, you can make someone smile for a minute. And then ask them how happy they are. And they'll rate them themselves a little bit happier than the, you know, control group that's not smiling. And I would think, you know, things like that, like maintaining eye contact, all of that could be a similar effect. It's like, do the things that you would do if you were in love and then see. Those might actually make you feel like you're in love again, you know. And mm -hmm. it doesn't hurt to try it, right? 